Round 10 of the FIDE Grand Prix tournament in Baku was when all the decisive action took place. I'd like to take a look at the game between Lenia Dominguez from Cuba and Fabiano Caruana, the man of the moment. But going into round 10, I'm afraid he'd hit the buffers. There was a big pile-up in first place, six players. So could Caruana somehow regain the initiative? Let's take a look. He has the black pieces here. And it's a symmetrical English. This is a very well-known position. And here white has a big choice, e3, e4, for example, d3, and rook b1 is also a very common move, trying to get action going on the queen side. But I have to say, after looking at this game, um, I'm not too impressed with white's opening, actually, because this demonstration on the queen side for white actually doesn't really get very far against black's very solid setup here. Um, and it's not clear that, well, rook b1 certainly doesn't help white's development on the king side. So, yeah, I'm not impressed with this um, idea. I, I don't call myself an expert on this position, but still, I, I would feel very comfortable with black. And it's interesting to see that many uh, strong players are playing exactly like this as black uh, against the, well, using this symmetrical English. Anyway, let's go on. Bishop b2. Okay, some development for white. And e6. Now, apparently this is a new move, according to my database, but uh, it looks very, very sensible to control the d5 square and prepare to bring the knight to e7. Um, previously, queen d7 has been played, also not bad, but I like e6 very much. And now I think white should simply bring a piece out and then knight e7 and the game goes on um, but instead Dominguez tried knight b5 Caruana exchanged but again this doesn't really help you know, white's development on the king's side while Caruana is actually just developing very soundly and you know this little demonstration here really doesn't get very far at all e3 from Dominguez and there are a lot of holes in White's position now actually and castles so Caruana just doing all the simple things here and already you can see that if White makes a seemingly natural move like knight e2 in fact this loses material to a little tactic knight takes b4 so if the knight is captured then you can see bishop takes g2 so black is winning material there. And if bishop b7, well, it, it gets a little bit complicated, but basically black is going to win material after this. So because of that, Dominguez have to play knight f3, which isn't perhaps ideal, because after knight e5, um, black is able to take the initiative straight away. Looking at these weakened squares here, and well, you know, f3 is a little bit uh, weak as well. Um, well, obviously there's a pin, so white can't really take that. So d3 plugs some gaps. But now Caruana, uh, well, it's very sharp-eyed actually. He takes the initiative by giving up his bishop and then playing d5. And this is remarkably uh, awkward move to deal with actually. Um, I mean, white has a, a big choice of moves, but nothing is very satisfactory. So for example, we could take on c5, but then this is very awkward. Black doesn't need to worry about this being taken. Well, the, the queen can recapture. There's also a check there as well, forking. Um, and if c takes d5, then knight takes d5, and there's still um, a lot of pressure here, and it's very awkward for the knight, it can't return to this square, so after this move, um, a6 drives the knight away and, and black's knight comes in, and well this is a problem, the queen is attacked, the bishop is attacked, black is doing well there, and if white makes a simple move, like castle's kingside, then we can take here, and this is lots of 
exchanges is rather complicated. Um, black can simply give up the exchange for a moment. But this is a fantastic initiative and is about to land a very nasty check on f3. And this is good for black. So Dominguez was forced to cover this square and play bishop e2. But it's clear this is not the ideal square for the bishop. You know, He would like this bishop on the long diagonal. Um, on e2, it's a very modest placement. And, yeah, black is taking the initiative. Well, Carawan has a couple of options. Um, I think, you know, it must have been very tempting for him to play a6, drive the knight back, and then exchange off into an endgame like this, and then play one of one of these rooks to c8 um, but he probably felt that there were too many exchanges and even if he wins a pawn here maybe white gives a pawn um, and perhaps he can put his king on c2 after giving a pawn and, and you know maybe he could draw that position but that's I mean he would have seen that that's definitely better for black but I think this next move shows how ambitious he was he played d4 very interesting move. Keeping the tension. So I think we've seen in this tournament how ambitious Caruana can be. So now we've reached a Benoni type position. Okay, first of all, white has to do something about knight, the knight. He has to save the knight. It's trapped at the moment. So he gives the knight a square. But Caruana realized that after this move, he can break up white's pawns on the queen side and gain control of the c5 square. So this is what happened. And in this case, so you can see it's a, a Benoni type structure, you know, with the pawn on d4 and, and white pawns um, here. But this is favourable for black because the bishop is poorly placed and white has to be rather careful here. Um, Black has a very clear plan, so this is a very nice manoeuvre. So this is what I mean by gaining control over the c5 square. The knight is redeploying to c5, and from there it looks at these two weak pawns. And black has a clear plan of playing rook a6 and rook over to gang up on this pawn here. So nice play from Caruana. Certainly he has the initiative, and white has to be careful. Queen a1 threatens pawn here. e5 protects that pawn. And now if white continues making normal moves, so let's play rook b5, well let's see this plan in action. So if white waits, then you know this pawn is going to be gone. So what happens if white exchanges? Well we can see that black still has a clear positional plus. The queen is attacked, the queen comes back, and now the rook switches over and you can see how potentially weak this pawn on d3 is. The knight on c2, very poorly placed, no perspectives there. So Dominguez tries to shake things up with f4. But this, of course, is a risky move because it's exposing his own king. I think objectively it's probably okay, but very double-edged. The point is, well, it's rather similar to the last variation we saw, but in exchanging rooks, white hopes to be able to simplify the position and maybe, you know, this weakness of d3 isn't so bad. And maybe he should play a5 here and allow this exchange. Black exchanges everything. But, I mean, black is still better in this position. Um, I mean, this is an uncomfortable move to have to meet. But maybe white can just sit there very solidly. I mean, it's it's very uncomfortable to live with a pawn on e3, but it might be tenable. Let's go back. Dominguez, unfortunately, traded here. We can see his idea, but actually in giving up this f-file, he left his king in mortal danger. Let's have a look. So he carried out this plan of exchanging off the weak pawn on the A-file. 
but now his pieces are just way too far from the king side. For example, if queen b6, then queen f6, and it's very simple. The queen comes in and it's decisive. So the queen had to come all the way back, but you can see white's pieces are just way offside here. And that's a standard Benoni-type breakthrough, of course, that can't be taken at the moment because the d-pawn would come through. And another excellent move from Caruana. Look at these beautiful knights and all the pressure here and looking at the king side as well. White is cracking here. I mean, Domingo's running short of time, just uh, yeah, completely collapsed, but this is an unenviable defensive task. And Caruana broke through. What a triumph of centralization. Every picture tells a story. Look at this. Fantastic centralization. And after this, 94, Domingo's resigned. There's no sensible defense to Rook F2 and so on. So Caruana took the lead or went... Um, well, he was, he was in the lead after round nine, but after round 10, he found himself in the lead again with Boris Gelfand, who also won in round 10. Uh, let me just show you Gelfand's game in round 10 very quickly, just the end of it. Gelfand with the white pieces has an extra pawn. Things are looking very good for him. He played a3, wanting to drive this bishop back, and then he can take on a5. And... Rodyabov uh, should probably play a4 and then, well, it, he can try to complicate the position like this. But instead, Rajabov um, played knight d2 and now it's completely lost. So some exchanges. So black is the exchange up here, but this is a very powerful pass port. And whoops. Let's, let's fire the bishop correctly. There we are. So the bishop covers the a8 square and that's really terrible. In the meantime this knight is also trapped. So f5 that prevents bishop e4 but then rook c7 and this rook is coming back. If black tries to, ex to save the knight then this pawn just flies through supported by the bishop. No defense. So after rook c7 e5 came, but then rook c1, and the knight is lost. So Rajabov resigned, a disastrous game from him. So going into the final round, Caruana shared the lead with Gelfan. Now the ra ra last round was not the most thrilling. Um, there were lots of draws. The only decisive game was Grishuk, who beat Dominguez, poor guy. Um, so Grishuk uh, moved into joint second position, but Everyone else drew, so that meant that Gelfand and Caruana shared first, half a point ahead of a pack of others. That is a very good result for uh, Caruana and Gelfand. So they get loads of Grand Prix points. Remember, there are four Grand Prix tournaments, and the two top players at the end of those tournaments will qualify for the candidates next uh, candidates tournament um, and that's it's definitely a prize worth having so a solid final round from from Caruana and Gelfand but I can't blame them at all and they're looking good in in this series the next um, FIDA Grand Prix tournament takes place in just five days time in Tashkent and the top four players here Caruana, Gelfand, Karyakin and Nakamura will all play there. Look out for that one, I'll be reporting from there too.